Now let me introduce our speaker. Daniel McIntyre has been with uh, the Interfaith Food Bank for almost 20 years, and uh, she's a native of this city and uh, passionate about what she does. And I'm going to let her uh, introduce, elaborate on her topic, but we are dealing with food insecurity and uh, uh, the issues around not having enough tea. Danielle. Well, thank you for having me. It is a pleasure to come out into the community and get out of my office. And uh, it's not the warmest of days out there, but it's still nice and fresh outside. So it's nice to be here. Um, today, I was asked to speak about food insecurity. We know it's a, a rising concern. And uh, the work that we do at Interfaith Food Bank is a way that people can help with the issue. It will not solve the issue, but it will help the issue. And so I will apologize in advance. I'm about the least tech savvy individual in the world. Um, I am uh, much better at just speaking than walking you through a slide presentation, but I'm told that all I have to do is click the button, so we will cross our fingers that all goes well. So I am Danielle McIntyre, I'm the Executive Director with Interfaith Food Bank, and I have been with the organization since 2006, in which time I have seen the rise and fall of the need in this community. And what I'm very proud of is the ability of our organization to adapt to those changing needs in our community. We've changed a lot over the years, and I'll go through that in our presentation here. So the first thing that I want to talk about is what is food security. It is the state of having reliable access to a sufficient quantity of affordable and nutritious food. So it's not just about having enough food, it's about being able to get to it, being able to get enough of it, and being able to make sure that we can afford good food, not just any food. So you are not food secure if there is a 7-Eleven within walking distance. You are not necessarily food secure if there's a safe way right across the street, if you can't afford the groceries that are in it. Right now, uh, we are seeing a lot of need, not just in Lethbridge, but throughout the country. And Food Banks Canada, just last week, uh, put out their poverty report card. And unfortunately, almost every province received a failing grade due to uh, inadequate responses at all levels of government to the rising insecurity uh, that we're seeing across the country. So 2.8 million Canadians right now are living in poverty. Even more than that are food insecure. Living in poverty is easy to chart because of numbers and tax returns and the metrics that are there. Not everybody reports when they don't have enough to eat and not everybody actually goes to a food bank or an agency to get help. Many suffer in silence. Last year, one in five Albertans, that's 20%, uh, were food insecure. In this last year, we've seen a rise in that to now one in four. That's 25%. The national average is at 18%. 30% of Albertans are living in inadequate uh, standard of living. What is, what is an adequate standard of living? For me, it would be a warm house with good food, enough money to buy the clothes that I need, maybe transportation, maybe I could see a movie every now and then. Is that <laughs> adequate? 14% of Albertans are living in a severely inadequate state of living. And that is just not acceptable in a country like Canada. From 2019 to 2022, pre to post pandemic, food banks in Alberta saw a 73% increase in demand. And this last year, as I mentioned before, another 30 to 40%. So what lends to food insecurity? The big three, mental health. When people don't feel good about themselves, they are not able to keep jobs, they're not able to get jobs, they're not able to pay their bills appropriately or remember all the things that they need to do. And right now, one in three Albertans are in, uh, finding that their mental health is prohibiting them from having a good, stable income source. 56% of Albertans are stating that addictions are a major issue in their communities. We've seen that here. We're seeing it as an epidemic across the country. And that all stems back to mental health. 
Income inequality is the other big thing. Gap between rich and poor is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. A lot of that is generational wealth that's not being passed on or it's gone now. But the bigger issue is that people who are in poverty are staying in poverty. And a lot of that is generational because of poor social assistance programs. In Alberta, we have one of the worst ratings for our social assistance supports, not even meeting 33% of the poverty line. Disability services and disability assistance matches only 30% or 37% of the poverty line. So we're taking people who are already struggling and keeping them in poverty because we have inadequate programs. We also have the highest percentage of working people that still can't afford to buy their groceries. That's income inequality, and that's due to having low-paying jobs or part-time jobs with not enough hours to earn enough income to buy your food. And recently, cost of living. Everyone is feeling the pinch right now. I know myself, I double-check what I put in the cart. I will eat that yogurt one more day just because there's not as much money to buy everything that I need to buy. Biggest issue, housing. 35% of Albertans are paying more than 30% of their income just on housing. And then another 56% on the costs that are beyond housing like internet and transportation and groceries. So that leaves us with 9% of our total income I'm hoping this is net income, because otherwise, taxes have taken the rest and we're upside down before we start. 22% of Albertans, Canadians uh, across the country, could not afford an unexpected expense of $500. So this is an issue that is not just for the typical food bank user. This is impacting Canadians all across the country. The big thing we see is that poverty doesn't affect everybody the same. And we have certain populations that are struggling a lot more than others, and those are the ones that we can see. That's our indigenous population, racialized, people from visible minorities, and then people who are from gendered communities. They experience poverty at much higher rates than other groups, primarily because they are not as accepted as other groups, or have not been able to have all of the resources necessary to assimilate into the society as we know it. Indigenous people in urban areas, again, much higher percentage of people who are living in poverty, and it is particularly bad in the north. 40% of racialized people report low employment, and 38% are having a hard time keeping a job if they can get it. And so there are a lot larger systemic issues that breed into poverty and food insecurity. 20% of non-binary individuals are also living below the poverty line. Cost of groceries. Everybody knew inflation was coming, we were expecting it, but we were expecting to see about seven to 11% on groceries. Some things have stayed the same, but a lot of the things we put in our hampers have seen some drastic increases. So cereal, 14% up. Fresh produce, 16%. Canned vegetables, up 17%. Craft dinner, 17%. Pasta sauce, 21% increase. And dry soup, 68% increase, because we went from 60 cents to a dollar. And so what we are seeing is people who are having a hard time buying their groceries before were making choices that would have them choose cheaper, less nutritious options because they could afford them. But now they can't afford them either. So why are grocery costs so out of control? Can't point our finger at corporate greed all of the time. Inflation is a general issue with every industry, not just with our groceries. War, there is war everywhere, but particularly the war right now in, with Russia and Ukraine is impacting fertilizer costs, the biggest bread basket in the world, and everything has a ripple effect. The more it costs to grow the food, the more it costs to transport what food is available, the more we have to pay the people to get it out into the grocery stores and eventually onto our plates. So there's always that cyclical whirlwind that's happening when you start to have disruptions to what should be a normal, even keel. Extreme weather and climate change are also issues. 
If you destroy a crop, that crop's not available. Now it's more valuable, what is available, and it costs more money. We also have increased wages and fuel costs. You gotta get the food from one place to another and you gotta pay people and trucks to do it. Tariffs and taxes, also eat another good chunk into what we're paying for our groceries. And policy decisions are impacting absolutely everything. We knew during COVID that we were living in an imaginary world where everybody had $2,000 to go out and pay for their groceries. We prepared at Interfaith Food Bank and took advantage of the fact that we didn't have the time to run our community events. And we invested that time in strategic planning and getting ready for the COVID recovery because we knew that once that temporary support went away, we were gonna have increased need all over again. So what should the government do? The biggest thing that we can point a finger to is having better social support programs. Not penalizing people who are trying to move beyond them, but encouraging them to do so if they have the ability to. But if we are telling people, don't worry, we got your back, you paid into all of these programs, they're gonna help you with your rent and food. Then they should cover the rent and the food. And they don't. The maximum age benefit right now is less than $1,800. We know that rent is gonna cost everybody a minimum of $1,000 in this community. And then if 56% of that, the rest of the money is gonna go to transportation and groceries and whatnot, people are not left with enough for just their basic needs. Never mind that adequate standard of living. We also have a major housing crisis. That's where most people's money is going, primarily to housing. And if we don't have affordable housing, then people don't have the disposable income for the other things that they need in their lives. Mental health is also another issue. We need investments in that area. With Alberta having the largest percentage of working people coming to the food bank, we can see that there are employment issues. People are getting sporadic jobs, not long-term jobs, or they're getting jobs that are just not paying them enough, or we have systems set up so that as soon as they hit a certain number of hours, ooh, now they're eligible for certain benefits, which is gonna cost that company or that organization more, and so we don't want them to work more hours because then we have to pay them more. So if we are investing in employment strategies that are actually going to do something for the people who are working, then we will be able to limit the number of people who are working that need the food bank. The other big thing is prioritizing the people who have those specific needs, like our indigenous peoples, the racialized communities, and our gendered communities. But what we're seeing right now is that we made some progress with women and children with some of the policies that were made, like the universal child benefit, um, and we are seeing, instead of huge numbers of women and children at the food banks, our fastest growing population is single adults who live alone. Many of them are seniors, but the majority of them are single working people. It just isn't possible to float a house by yourself anymore. Children are always a priority for investment because if we can't invest in the prevention and the early intervention that will not cause these issues for people in the future, then we're not really making a, a fresh start of anything. So the most important thing for us is that government needs to work together at all levels of government and within departments of the government. I tried to help my son. He hasn't received his tax return yet. He filed it the same day as my husband and I, but his just didn't come in the mail. I am an educated individual with a good paying job, and I could not get through or speak to anyone who was able to help me help my son. And just imagine what it would be like for someone with English as a second language, or somebody who has no literacy skills, or has a history of authorities and government agencies being corrupt, where it's a fear for them to even try to contact the government. Service Canada doesn't talk to Revenue Canada. It's a problem. It's a fixable problem. I just think they should do it. But I'm not a policymaker. I'm a community organizer. So what I try to do is encourage people to look at it from their level. What can you do? What can 
the average ordinary Joe do to address food insecurity? Well, we can all make a lot of noise. We can reach out to our governments. We can keep making them put food on the table. Have them discuss the issues that are going to address food insecurity. And that goes right from your municipal right up to the federal level. Make a noise. People will hear it. Be a champion for the fact that people should have enough food to eat. The other thing is empower future generations. You want to encourage those children to start out with literacy skills. We want them to have skills to get good jobs, not just any job. And the hope and the understanding that they deserve to have good work. I talked to a teacher years back who told me that she had been told that not every child was going to go to university. And therefore, they should not teach every child about the skills that they need to go to university. And we should cater things to the abilities and the skill sets of the children as they come to class. I say, why do we limit that? Why do we decide who's going to have what potential? Let's give them all the same potential so that they have the ability to break that generational poverty cycle that keeps so many families from progressing. Pay fair wages to your employees. Or support businesses that do. Interfaith Food Bank was the first certified living wage employer in Lethbridge. We're a food bank. If we can do it, private business and government can certainly do it. Set an example, walk the talk. The other thing is share. That's what food banks do. We share. We encourage you to support your neighbors. If you know some lady from church isn't looking quite as well, it might be because she's not eating. Invite her over for dinner. Share with your neighbors. Support the social agencies and food banks that are out there trying to make a difference by giving up your food, giving up your funds. And the biggest thing that we need right now is your free time. Most social agencies rely on volunteers, and that's something that any community can do. So we invite you to join us. Come join the fight against hunger with us. And we have a million things that you might be interested in. So I'll tell you a little bit about Interfaith Food Bank. So we've been around since 1989, and uh, our mission is to recognize the human dignity of those in need and to provide access to food and resources generated from within our community. We're a bunch of community people with like-minded mentality that if we put our hands together and our minds together and our resources together, we can help one another to progress our community. What we aim to do is meet the immediate needs first. You can't move on if you don't have your foundation. So we meet the immediate needs first. But then we also try to empower those that we're working with to move beyond the food bank. We want them to be able to get the skills and the knowledge and the hope and the desire and the understanding that they deserve more than standing in a food bank lineup every day. Primarily volunteer run organization. I work for a volunteer board of directors, and we do have 13 paid staff, but we have over 150 volunteers that actually do all of the work to process food from donation to distribution. And we've got one of the larger numbers of community hours uh, in Lethbridge. Uh, last year, we did over 17,000 hours in volunteer service. I mentioned our mission statement earlier, and the main things that we do in helping is providing that emergency food assistance, Connecting people to other agencies in the community. We're food and facility people. We try not to be the programmers. And so basically we create the environment in which it can happen and the supplies with which agencies can work with. And what we want to do is build the bridges to get those people who are at our doorstep to be able to connect with the agencies that have the skills, the expertise, and the government funding to get them the support they need to address those underlying issues that are making them food insecure. People will come and ask for help when they don't have any food. They will not necessarily come and ask for help if they're having parenting problems. It is one of those things where we can capture that group, make them feel welcome, make them feel like we're actually going to do something to try to help them, and then build the bridge to the next organization that can help them with those underlying problems. We also dive into knowledge and skill building with the help of our partners. We host a lot of workshops 
We have uh, how to get a better job workshop. We have workshops learning how to garden. Uh, we have food preservation workshops. Anything that brings people into the food bank to see what we are doing builds networks of community support. It also helps build our base of donors and volunteers. And it shows the community what we're doing on top of the fact that you have a great time while you're there and meet some people you might not have otherwise. The big uh, addition to what we've been doing in the last few years is the Food Hub and the Food Share Program. So Interfaith Food Bank is the Southern Alberta Food Hub for Food Banks Alberta. So our facility is large and we can bring in truckloads to our building where we distribute out to other agencies. So we serve individuals and families at the front of our building, but we serve <coughs> other agencies and area food banks out the back in bulk quantities. Food Share is a program where we're supporting agencies, even like the Senior Center here, with surplus food that we have. So the soup kitchen, the other food bank, the Woods Home, Streets Alive, you name the agency, they probably have a connection with us at least through our Food Share program, if not through our client advocacy programs and the resources and referrals that we're doing. So who do we serve? I've got some demographics up here on the screen, and I also brought a few copies of our annual report. I think there's only 10 here, but if you're interested, please take one. It's also available on our website. But you can see from the chart on, on the screen here that uh, we are just under half of the people who are serving our children, over half of who are serving our women, small percentage of seniors, and then we also have a small percentage of students. We do have both college and university food banks, but a lot of them don't have the capacity to be able to do the, the level of service that we do at Interfaith Food Bank or the additional programs that Interfaith Food Bank offers. So a lot of mature students with families will choose to come to either Interfaith or Lethbridge Food Bank as opposed to taking advantage of the small supports they can get on campus. Indigenous and New Canadians make up with the same percentage at the food bank as they do within our larger community. These statistics are from last year. So last year we were doing an average of 663 hampers per month. Hampers are per household. So that was working out to around 1,500 to 1,700 individuals. September, 866 hampers. Well over 2,000 individuals coming for help. They live in all sorts of different living situations. Um, we have 42% that have children in the home. So one in every second house has children in it. 26% are single parent families. Two parent families only make up 16%. The largest portion is single individuals at 45%. And again, that's because it's very hard to float a home on your own. They live in primarily private housing. Housing is the big issue. Only 10% of people who are accessing the food bank have access to social housing. Unacceptable. We need more. Lack of money is the main reason people come to the food bank. We hear about addictions and we hear about crime and we hear about all these bad habits that people have. Or the fact that they might not have budgeting skills. You can't budget what you don't got. So lack of money is why people are not having enough food on the table. And this chart here, again, it's in our annual report. It shows you numbers are rising. The red is 2022, the, yellow, or the blue is 2021. Highest percentage, people want government programs. They're stuck there. We keep them there. Because if they try to earn any more, we claw back the government supports. So there's no security or motivation to try to move out of those systems. Again, one of the larger portions is working people. Some people are living just off of their child benefit. No other income. Thank God they got kids, right? I'm sure they bring in much more money than the kids cost. You can't just come and get help. You can. But if you want the hand out side of what we do, the hampers, the emergency food assistance, you do have to qualify for our services. We want to uh, make sure that we're helping people who need the help, 
And we want to honor our donors and supporters in making sure that we're using their resources wisely. But our emergency food assistance programs are the only programs where we have a screening process. All of our other programs in the kitchens, the gardens, even in our resource room, those are all offered to the community absolutely free of charge. We also assess everybody according to their own unique circumstances. We do use a low income cutoff, but just because you're under doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to um, not be able to help you. It just means we're gonna help you in a different way. In client services, you have to provide photo ID, Alberta healthcare cards, proof of your income, where's that money coming from, and then proof of your address. We only look at your expenses if you make more than our low income cutoff amounts. A hamper is five to seven days of emergency food assistance, and every hamper has the same stuff in it, just more of it if your household is larger. In the hamper is your non-perishable items, goodie bags, we also add on meat and frozen potato product, and then we have a perishable room where people can pick what they like. We do accommodate special dietary needs, and that is for medical, religious, or cultural preferences. We were very proud last year because of our changing demographics in our community. We were finding a lot of our Muslim families leaving half the hamper behind. So we changed, and we added halal hampers last year. We also have diabetic bundles, baby bundles, and we'll increase the hamper for the family who has a mother who is expecting, hoping for healthy mom to equal healthy child. And then our perishables are available in our pick room where families can choose what they want and they can come and access that every day. We also have baby bundles, safety packs, birthday bundles, and of course our very popular Christmas hampers. Information and referrals is how we offer that hand up, not the hand out. So we have a resource room, and we also have several classrooms that we use for these community programs and workshops in partnership with our, um, our other agency partners. We have a large building. We've been investing it over the last while, and we've got several spaces that are available for these community uh, programs. First is the co-op kitchen, a very large space. It can accommodate up to 100 people and it's very well used by community groups. We use it also. In that space, we use, um, we take all that zucchini that the clients are tired of taking and we will shred it all up and freeze it and make it into zucchini muffins, for example. We do a lot of baking, freezing, pickling, and then we did give that uh, product either out to our families or we use it for fundraising. We teach people how to share their resources and cook collectively through our Shop Smart and Collective Kitchen program. So they're going home with a week's worth of groceries that they prepared for themselves with friends and then can recreate that experience at home. We have a small thrift store. If you haven't been there, please go check it out. Everything you spend in there is gonna go back to support our programs. And all of the um, items that are in there are donated or reclaimed on our food loads that are coming in from manufacturers. And it offers a service to the families that are coming to the food bank where they can buy things a little less than they would pay somewhere else. We work in partnership with the Family Centre to have a teaching kitchen, where we're actually teaching people how to cook affordable food, healthy food, on that limited budget. We have a new program that was launched a couple of years ago called Health Hobbies. A lot of our seniors are aging out, so we want you to use your hobbies to benefit people in need. It's a really good program office drop-in and uh, workshops. We have two gardens. One is a learning garden, and the one we unveiled last year was our new Indigenous healing garden that has plants that were used for traditional medicine, food, and spiritual use. The workshops I mentioned before, they can range from yoga to planting pots, and then the food hub and the food share program that we talked about earlier. So I really do encourage you to stay engaged with us. If you want to know more about us, as I mentioned before, our annual report, our website, our great resources. But I also invite you to come down for a tour. Give us a call in advance. We'll walk you through the operation. You'll have the opportunity to see every uh, program that we've got, all the resources that you can uh, be engaged with in getting out to the community. Thank you so much. My name is Mark Gettle. Now, I'm not sure if it's true or not, but I believe that uh, somewhere I was reading that you don't accept 
food that's best before date, that's after the best before date. Is that true? And if so, why would that be? Because a lot of the best before date is just the way the company wants to keep the inventory going. It's excellent food. And, uh, and I know a lot of people are worried about that at their home and they would be happy to give it to you. So could you just tell us a little bit about the best before dates and how you handle that inventory? Certainly. So best before dates are completely different than expiry dates. If there's an expiry date on your food, it is no longer safe to eat. A best before date means it is in its best condition that the retailer or the manufacturer can be proud of when you eat it. And so best before does not mean bad after at the food bank and we work within guidelines established by Food Banks Canada as to how far past that date that we will distribute food. Yeah. We do have to comply with um, the health code and so there are a few things that we cannot accept past the as the best before date, and that is dairy Fish. And, and baby food. Yeah, dairy and baby food are the two things we can't accept past date, but everything else is good. If that fish has been processed through an approved facility, same with your meat. If it's got that blue stamp on it, we can give it out. We like to have it frozen before the best before date, and then it's good for another six months after that. I'll just ask another question, if I may. Um, what about guaranteed income? A lot of talk about if we, every Canadian had a guaranteed income, that it would solve a lot of these problems. But obviously, it wouldn't solve all the problems that you brought up. Because what's your feeling about guaranteed income for all Canadians, and would that really help out? So if you know me at all, I'm a die-hard redneck from Alberta. <laughs> I believe in the strapping on of the bootstraps and and earning your own. But I'm also a human that cares about other people and I recognize that not everybody has that ability. But if we have social programs, they should be enough to sustain people. Um, basic income, to me, is gonna depend on what it looks like, how, how is it rolled out. There are people who don't need more than they have right now. Um, but we saw during COVID, while the program was not great, people had access to money. And in that time, food bank use dropped in half. God. Wouldn't you know it? If people have money, they'll buy groceries with it. It wasn't until we have the government asking for the money back. Many people claimed it who weren't eligible for it. It is the post-pandemic uh, recovery uh, that is causing the issues with the income for a lot of our families because they've exhausted things like how much credit is available to them, or how many weeks they still have on EI. So if there's nothing after those government supports come out, you're left with nothing. So yes, I, I do agree with the concept of a basic income. I just would really like to see and understand how it would be rolled out to make it not just fair, but equitable and um, just. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Kurt Peterson. Thanks very much for coming, Danielle again. Uh, my question relates to uh, how do you work with local producers in terms of uh, getting fresh donations, which is very plentiful this time of the year, for example, and throughout the later part of the summer. Do you have any uh, specific uh, farms donating to you, uh, the Hutter Edge, for example, and there's a lot of potatoes, I know that for a fact, <laughs> being a farm of potato farmers, there's uh, all kinds of potatoes in the country this year that's not gonna, some of them are not even being harvested because they have no home. Do you have any uh, comments on how you deal with local producers? Yeah, we are very fortunate to live in an agricultural community and I can let you know that every major producer is contributing in some way. Hutterite colonies are incredible to us. Not only do they bring in their extra baking on top of their produce, but they write us checks too, which is quite lovely. Um, potatoes, yes, we have potatoes year round, which is lovely. It's the fresh leafy stuff that doesn't grow here that we run out of come the end of the season. 
and we used to be able to get a lot of that distressed produce from the grocery stores where we would take the ugly letter, uh, layers of the lettuce off and the inside would still be nice. But now people are willing to pay for less than perfect produce because it's cheaper than the other produce. And so that diminishes the amount that we have in our pick room for our families to take. And this year was the first year in my whole time at Interfaith Food Bank I had to buy stuff for that pick room. Usually it is for surplus and perishables, but we completely ran out. And there was nothing coming in from the grocers, and it wasn't growing season, so there was nothing more. And it is one of the more coveted items at the food bank, is the fresh. Um, and often why you'll see food banks encouraging the non-perishable and the canned vegetables is because it's seasonal. But we are very fortunate, and most of the local producers are contributors to uh, both food banks and to the soup kitchen, several other agencies. Uh, we also have a great partnership with the Agri-Food um, Center at Exhibition Park and Farmer's Markets. Uh, we love the day after Farmer's Market because everything comes in fresh, bagged, and beautiful. Um, but any produce is good produce as long as we're concerned. Hi, Danielle. Henning Mundell is my name. I know you're not a soothsayer, but I'm going to ask you to, a little bit to look in a crystal ball. You're a practical person, but, okay, food banks per se have been around a long time. In Lethbridge, they started in the early 80s with the concept for a few years to help out. Well, here we are, over 30 years later, 40 years later. Do you think they're can be a time where we will not need food banks. Your wish as well as mine. Um, I often talk about how people in the food bank world are the only ones that wish themselves out of a job. And yes, you're right. Food banks across the country started in the 80s. I think the oldest one is in Edmonton. And um, it was in response to the economic crisis in the 80s and labor unions saying, holy crow, my coworkers have no jobs and they have no money to buy their food, and so food banks began. <coughs> uh, the issue, food banks work in accepting and distributing food. Most of our government programs, because they don't pay appropriate amounts, the workers refuse their clients to the food banks. So food banks have now become woven into the social fabric of every community and it is very unlikely that there will ever be a day that there is no food bank. The best that I can hope for is that food banks will continue to evolve from the hand out to the hand up. Uh, that's the, the thing that makes me very proud to work at Interfaith is that we do more than just the hand out and trying to empower people to get out of the food bank lineup. If there are not substantial changes in the way our social programs are run, food banks will be here forever. There was a time when a lot of people referred to food banks as a band-aid. Recently, I heard a wonderful quote. Food banks aren't just a band-aid. Today, we're saving lives. We are a tourniquet that is stopping people from dying. That's pretty sad. People say, you know, why do you need to have uh, food banks and social programs? Well, ideally you don't. But why do you need paramedics and hospitals? Thank you. My name is Mike McKay, and uh, there's a word that I wanted to ask you about that I hadn't heard earlier, but then when I got up on the line, you mentioned checks. Uh, so <laughs> if I understand it correctly. I've been told that if I go to Safeway and buy 20 bucks worth of food and take it down and give it to you guys, that's nice. But if I take that $20 bill down and give it to you, I understand that you can do probably quite a bit more with it than, than what I can. Is that tr correct? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, number one, food banks don't pay retail for anything. We shouldn't have to. We're the food bank. We deserve a deal. We're helping people. The other side of it is that we purchase things in bulk quantities. We mass purchase on behalf of the food bank network, so we can access a lot of foods that is even coming from down east. 
Uh, food Banks Canada will take donations and buy food that gets shared amongst the food banks across the country. Uh, but the biggest part of what we do is actually surplus management. We're part of that waste management system where we're salvaging food that would go to the dump otherwise. So I can buy a truckload and transport it from Edmonton for $600, and there will be 28,000 pounds of food on there that's not retail perfect, but still completely safe. So I can leverage that financial gift from one dollar, one of your dollars, to three, at minimum, sometimes four. Thank you, Danielle, uh, for your presentation today. My name is Lori Schultz. Um, So I have a couple of questions here. Um, from an employment standards point of view, so employment standards, labor standards, it's called different things in different provinces, but basically they, uh, their legislation dictates you know, hours of work, um, general holiday pay, overtime, that sort of thing. Um, what would you like to see, and have you had any conversations or the ability to advocate for you know the differentiation between part-time hours and full-time hours, um, and how it impacts um, when when an employee can uh, receive benefits. In your presentation, you mentioned that people are working but they don't get the hours because that would push the employer over to pay them more. So that's one question. I, I, I'm hoping you could comment on. And the second is, with our social um, services programs, whatever they're called these days, working in Alberta or, or what have you, it's where the, you would receive um, social uh, assistance benefits up to a point of, of income before things are clawed back. Um, have you had any conversations or advocation with uh, our government um, to to change, you know, the the benchmark where things are clawed back, and I'm going to throw in a third question. Um, you just spoke about the the waste, you know, um, restaurants, bakeries, grocery stores. Have you seen differences in terms of, you know, uh, the bread or uh, restaurants rather than throwing the food out? Uh, share it with the food banks has is that still happening? Um, has it changed in any way? And um, if you need a reminder of the questions, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so um, take up the last one, the first, because it's the easiest. Yes, we get surplus from retailers, bakeries. Um, all that. Um, we're very fortunate. Food Banks Canada has made tremendous inroads with most of the major grocery lines. And so every local food bank is usually matched with a local Walmart, Loblaws, Safeway, Sobeys, all of your big ones. We're matched up. We are getting the stuff that they're not selling, for sure. What we are starting to see, though, is they are also feeling the pinch. And so what's happening is they're not buying as much, so then they're not wasting as much, or they're not producing as much, so they don't have as much to give away. Uh, same as the produce I was telling you about before, it's the same issue there. So yes, we have made tremendous inroads in building those partnerships with industry as well as with retail. Um, and uh, again, belonging to the National Food Bank Network really is a bonus for, for local food banks if they can participate with that because this, we're just a very wasteful nation. We overproduce and uh, we have very high standards. Uh, we have perfect digest. Um, an ugly tomato tastes just as good as a pretty one. The labor standards question. So I mentioned before, I'm not a policymaker. Um, we also do not do a lot of direct lobbying. What we do is data collection. And so we track the trends. Who's using the food bank? How many people are coming? Why are they coming? And all of that data is collected by Food Banks Canada who actually have lobbyists. Uh, food Banks Canada was very active in getting the universal child benefit passed. 
And so we do have many opportunities to advocate informally. Um, Food Banks of Alberta did a great job recently of having round tables with the MLAs, for example. So I'm always honest and open with my opinions. How far it goes after I voice them is the other issue. Now, one of the things I do like about Alberta and the Alberta labor standards is that it gives employers freedom of choice in how they treat their employees. Like I said, the food bank has chosen to be a living wage employer. We have not had benefits. No benefits in the food bank because we couldn't afford them. But now we're starting to see that we can't keep employees if we don't have the same type of packages elsewhere. And so I would hope that the Alberta labor standards are designed to inspire employers to aim higher, as opposed to abused by employers to abuse their employees. The other question was about... Okay, I, I hope I got them all. Um, again, uh, we're grassroots. We are at the front door. We're out there doing. We learn a lot of things that we pass up the chain for someone else to figure out. Thank you, Thank you for your presentation and, and the data and the changes that have happened. I'm Mary Shillington. I'm a retired clinical social worker. And I remember a woman coming to see me one time. And uh, I worked for Life by Shawnee Services. And, and uh, we had a sliding scale of costs for counseling. And she, I said, so uh, what do you want to pay today? Well, I got $5, so I'll give you $5. I said, what about milk and bread and stuff? Well, I don't have any of that. So we agreed we split it. <laughs> so she'd give me 250 for the agency, and she took 250 away and got what she needed. Um, my question is, uh, my understanding is that when people grow uh, their own fruits and vegetables, there's certain standards about that before they can give it to the food bank. Now, I'm just wondering if that's true, because a friend has this lush apple tree, and they're lovely fruit, uh, but they don't spread. And and so uh, could she give the multi, uh, she's given to everybody that she could within her circle, uh, but apples coming out of her ears, uh, could she be giving it to the food bank and uh, other people like her? So primarily it's the prepared foods that the uh, standards are applied to um, when it comes to uh, compliance with health code. So it is uh, not safe for me to take the cow that you butchered by yourself and give it up to food bank families because I don't know if it was done safely, if the temperature was maintained, if it was packaged appropriately, that kind of thing. But fresh produce is fair game. If you've grown it, we'll eat it. We just don't want the rotten, yucky ones that have been laying on your grass for weeks and weeks and weeks that you wouldn't eat. And so what we often will say, if you wouldn't eat it, don't give it to somebody else. But if you would eat it, please bring it down to us. Now I'm not gonna say we don't go through apple season where our whole cooler is full of apples because at one time our city decided to put crab apple trees everywhere and nobody downs anymore. But our food recovery program will take all of those apples and they will turn it into apple juice and our clients will easily take it if those apples aren't perfect. Thank you very much, Daniel, for this presentation. Um, I am Boli, a postdoctoral fellow um, at the University of Lethbridge. My interest area is food security um, in Lethbridge. Um, I have some questions. I wonder because by the time we're coming to Canada, uh, we're not aware about the food bank. Maybe we had so many information that immigration sent and we were preoccupied with just traveling and that did not occur to us because we had a challenge when we arrived in Canada. And we had to pay our rent, so they didn't want the money cash. 
they wanted us to do, to get into our bank account. So we deposited all of our money into the bank and they did not tell us we would go on hold maybe for 10 days. So we had nothing. Um, just being in Canada for the day, and we never knew where to go, just for maybe short-term assistance. Um, the next thing is, even if we knew where to go, um, coming from, maybe we had good social standing, and we were not going to food banks, even if we knew that there were food banks, we would have maybe been reluctant to go, or maybe think that there was, there's this stereotype, um, those who go to food banks, because we're coming to contribute to the economy, we're not coming to benefit from the economy. So um, coming to your doors, do you see people who struggle with maybe self-esteem to come, and how do you help with that? First, maybe knowledge on those who are coming in, how do they really know about us? And if they're actually knocking your doors, it takes a lot of courage to do that. So how do you really work around that? Thank you very much. Thank you for that question. Um, this is not an uncommon experience for new immigrants. Um, we are often assured that, don't worry, these immigrants aren't coming to eat up the housing that's available. Don't worry, these immigrants aren't going to take the jobs or they aren't going to access the social programs. These are educated professionals that will easily assimilate into your community. The trouble is we don't equip those people with knowledge and skills about what it's like here in Canada. And that, yeah, you can't put all your money into the bank account and expect to have it right back out. These are things that, again, are not food bank issues. These are immigration issues. And it doesn't make, it doesn't take a rocket science to say, oh, you've got somebody coming from another country, maybe you should tell them what it's like here before they come, right? I think it would be lovely if we extended some of the supports that we offer to our refugees to other immigrants as well. And that's one of the big barriers. It's not every immigrant is going through a, a program. Many immigrants have the capacity to come here on their own, but then when they get here, they learn things they didn't know in advance, and they get stuck in a point where they need to come for temporary support. We saw tremendous outpouring of support for our Ukrainian refugees. Tremendous support, and good on us for doing that. But what frustrates me is every issue that has been raised about the trouble the Ukrainians are having and are the same issues that every other immigrant population has experienced when they come to Canada. Housing is not sufficient. Financial um, institutions are not accommodating, not just to people who haven't um, lived in Lethbridge for a while, but people who haven't lived in Canada for a while. Just to get a bank account nowadays is so much more difficult. And it's one of those things that, again, I feel like is a policy issue. Immigrants are coming to contribute to our community. A fellow talked to me in my office a while ago and told me a story about the glass of water. The, the, the community was very concerned that uh, if more people came, it would just eat up all the resources. So he said, take that glass of water, put more water in it. Put more water. He said, no, pull it all the way to the top. Now, immigrants are like sugar. Put some sugar in that water. See if it overflows. If it doesn't overflow, it just makes it sweeter. So yes, we should be welcoming these people to our community, but we should also be um, limiting the problems that they have when they get here by preparing them in advance and making it not a shameful thing to ask for help when you need it. And that's one of the things that Interfaith that I really strive to do is make it a very welcoming, non-judgmental, dignified experience. It's scary. It's embarrassing. Nobody wants to admit that they don't have enough food for their family. But when you walk in our doors and someone greets you with a smile, and it's clean, and it looks nice, and there's friendly faces, we try to take that stigma away so that people can feel not just grateful for the help, but inspired to help the next ones that need the help come through that door. Okay, our time is running out and we're committed to be out by one, but let's take these two questions. I'll ask you to be brief in your asking and brief in your answering. Okay. Hi. My name 
name's Carol Sakia. Um, how do I choose to donate to you, the Lethbridge Food Bank, or the Salvation Army? That's my one question. Um, and once, I have four, but I'll I think you only get one question at this point. Oh. I want to know the, the actual starting uh, living wage of a base position at the Interfaith Food Bank. No one at Interfaith Food Bank makes less than $20.30 an hour. Um, how do you choose which one to support us all? Please support us all. Um, but uh, I would say go with your heart. Uh, Lethbridge Food Bank and Salvation Army are tremendous organizations. We partner with them on multiple projects. Uh, upcoming will be Christmas Hope, where you also see us partner with My City Care, Lethbridge Family Services, Volunteer Lethbridge. Um, when you work with agencies that are willing to work together, uh, for the common good, it, it doesn't make a difference which one of us you donate to. But donate to me. That's that's what you should do. <laughs> Last question. Beth McLatherstone, thank you very much for your talk. I noticed when you mentioned all the groups that were <clears throat> having trouble with food security that it has to do with isms, whether we are racist or um, against just against all these different groups. So these are the groups that are having the greatest problems. Um, also with AISH and the clawbacks, the people on AISH can make $800, but after that, every $2 they make $1 as clawback. So I was very happy to hear that you've, you've got the uh, Food Bank Canada lobbyists. Uh, I wondered why is Alberta the worst province in terms of um, food insecurity going from 20% to 25% of people uh, in need of food. A large portion of that reason is because we were doing the best for a long period of time. Alberta was one of the wealthiest provinces. Everybody was coming here to get work because this is where you could get work. And people were getting paid decently and they were able to make a living. Um, in recent years that has changed. Um, a lot of political reasons why that has changed. Um, but uh, I think the biggest issue that we have is that um, we had a major change in government. There was new policies that came in that were implemented very quickly and then a very quick shift back from that. And so our government is catching up. Um, but the main reason that uh, we are seeing such high levels of food insecurity in Alberta are because our social programs are not adequate and because our working people are not fairly, uh, fairly paid. I'll remind you what the pink sheets on your table say, and that is that next week's topic is around child abuse, so you don't want to miss that. Do you, want to that? Do you have a last word you'd like to say? Uh, just very grateful for all the great questions. I appreciate having such an engaged group. Uh, again, if you want to know more about us, please do check us out online. Um, our website, and of course, if you're tech savvy, the social media is always the most current information. Uh, and then I did bring some of the annual reports. If you're interested in any further information, please do shoot us an email or give us a call. And again, I welcome you all if you'd like to learn more. Come down and ask for a tour. So we thank Daniel.